What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Work River Podcast. I'm your host, Roy Edwards, and today we're going to be talking about pie day and how there's freedom in chicken pot pie. See you on the other side. of our lives inside either in traffic at work or close eye how about we all agree that is way overdue to take back our lives okay so welcome to the work river podcast we got four flavors of this episode well no not the episodes of the show we have four four flavors of the show First is Homegrown with Haley. That is my wife. We're talking about lifestyle. We're talking about homeschooling. We're talking about homesteading. We're talking about all things of the home surrounding the lifestyle of working wherever. Then there is the Internet Hotspot. That's with Sydney. We're going to get those going again here in the new year. We have obviously changed our studio around, which has led to us changing the frequency of how often Sydney is on these podcasts. So thank you for bearing with us on those, but we'll get back into those here shortly. Then we have the long form. That's going to be with our friends as an interview. We're going to do one of those a month. We had Bobby Chang on previously on an episode to come on and talk about Copilot and some open AI. We've had April Dunham on here to talk about Power Platform. Uh, we've had all kind. Of, we've had three different, three separate Microsoft MVPs on this show. So... I look forward to bringing on a whole lot of more experts this year. About one a month, we have Josh Kosnick coming up here as our next guest who's going to talk about EOS and some systems and processes because I do love me some systems and processes. And then you got Roy's Rants episode, which is this, and we've already dove in. And today is about systems and processes and a day or so after Pi Day hit, which is 3.14 Apple Pi for my belt bearing people out there, and which is March 14th. And that is, that's Pi Day. And so for this year for Pi Day, we released an excerpt from the book that I've been writing, which uh, it does have a title, but I don't think I want to, re- I'm ready to release it yet because I still want to do some A-B testing on the title itself. But I released one of the chapters on LinkedIn through our newsletter. And so our, the newsletter states, or is called, There's Freedom in Chicken Pot Pie, which also happens to be the name of this podcast. And so it talks about, in the article, and I'm not going to just read the article because you can always just go and read it, but it talks about how there is freedom in the dinner table and that we as a society have come to a point where it's no longer expected for all members of the family to sit at the dinner table together. In fact, the latest survey that was sent out didn't even ask the question or wasn't even included in the response as the number one uh, most frequent answer to be every day. In fact, the Family Dinner Project, who is the nonprofit organization who focuses on the impacts of dinner table time, on the family and in the country, they indicated that approximately 88% of Americans eat dinner with their family every night or a few times a week. So while that number 88% seems high, they've actually combined the two or three top answers of the survey in previous years. So it used to be the number one question, or, or if we're talking about a Likert scale of least to high one you know how likely how many days a week do you eat with your family one being never five being every day five used to be every day now that includes a few times a week so that's how far we've fallen as a country in the expectations of sitting down together as a family now the family dinner project along with multiple other nonprofit organizations have followed this trend and talked about this trend of the importance of having both family members at the dinner table and how it affects the mental um, the mental health of family members. And so the Family Dinner Project noted that the number of family dinners has declined 33%. And they, of course, they attribute this to busy schedules, 
prepared food, managing picky eaters, and then, of course, work, the big one there, to say that members are at work. They're commuting. They have to get back into the office, right, which is what we've seen. Now, on COVID, I would assume those numbers were a little bit higher during the pandemic. We probably saw more members at the dinner table. But I think it's important to note that there are times even when remote workers don't make it down into their the dinner table, which is that work-life balance of pulling away from from your work, where we saw that remote workers oftentimes put in longer hours instead of working the nine to five, they might be working eight thirty to six because they don't want to have that commute and work through that commute. And if you're working until six, maybe dinner time was at five thirty, and maybe you do make it downstairs to the table, but you're thirty minutes late. And for me, that's not excusable. So much happens at the dinner table. The studies show that even sitting quietly together brings families closer rather than sitting not together or not at all, or, or sitting not sitting together at all. So if you were to all eat dinner at the same time in different rooms, that is not as beneficial as sitting together in quiet, with obviously the most beneficial being sitting together and having conversation. So the amount that we connect over the dinner table, it's going to affect your children, it's going to affect the members at the table, not only in that exact moment, but as they grow into adulthood and start to have their own families and the, the, the expectations around the dinner table change. And so my father was a remote worker, which is part of the reason why I'm such an advocate for it is because I saw firsthand the benefits of what all comes with a remote working parent. And my father, he serviced cloud storage. He was a cloud storage salesman, worked for some uh, big name companies that if I were to tell you who they were, you would know exactly who they were. And he sold storage to the Department of Defense and to the government. And then my mother was, uh, I guess you would call her a stay-at-home mom or a housewife, even though, as I pointed out in the article, that when people ask me, and I've said this on this podcast before, when I had interviewed my brother and we talked about our childhood and growing up, who my brother is also an entrepreneur, when we talked about who was the more of the entrepreneur, whether it was my father or my mother, I often pointed to my mother simply because the amount of things that she had to juggle that were completely different. She wore multiple hats. Yes, she was the primary caretaker of my brother and I, brothers. Yes, she had to prepare the food. Yes, she had to manage the schedules and she helped out with the church and she did, uh, you know, things in the local PTA. She was a PTA president. And so there were so many things that she had to manage that were totally separate and totally different of one another. Whereas not to take anything away from my dad, who was working and was the primary breadwinner, I guess is what you would call that. He had one thing to do and that was sales. Now, as he, as my brother and I got older he became the sports coach and he became a varsity baseball coach and he was the president of the boosters club at the high school. So they both held that entrepreneurship, multiple roles, highly ingrained in the community. I just always point to my mother, I guess maybe just kind of playing a little devil's advocate, but now as being a parent, I see the amount of work that goes into managing household schedule and just making sure that there is food on the table every night. It's basically inventory management of the cupboard and the refrigerator to make sure that there is enough food to put onto the table, which I did release the chicken pot pie recipe. If you all want to see it, it's on that, it's on that newsletter newsletter. And so my mom was a former salesman. My brothers, both brothers are salesmen. My dad was a salesman and I, I was, I obviously fell into tech. I obviously am not a salesman. Didn't go into sales, although I found myself more and more starting to get into the business development portions of the business as an entrepreneur and less in the day-to-day development. But, you know, I guess that's life. And so the table times together that we held because I had a remote working father and a mother who was a housewife, we always sat down and ate dinner together every night. Sir, there were times when the meals were probably a little bit more robust than others. But we always sat down together and ate. Sometimes that included leftovers. Sometimes it included a new meal that my mom had spent hours making. But 
the importance of us sitting down together was something that was ingrained uh, in us, which I brought into my family. My wife as well sat at the dinner table when she and we started dating. She talked about how uh, we wanted to, have to sit down and have dinners. And so in college, I started to cook for her. And so as we started to, well, I didn't really start to cook for her. I, I made like two or three things. So let's not, let's not act crazy like I'm some super chef here. But when my wife and I started dating, we often would share information about like what what was our childhood like, what were our meals, you know, the the, the typical dating information. And so one of the conversation comes up is like, what did you guys usually eat? And so she often brings up uh, sauerkraut and kielbasa, I believe is what it is, which we still eat at Thanksgiving every year, sauerkraut and kielbasa. And she also really enjoys um, cabbage and corn beef, which we eat. We have St. Patrick's Day, and we will sit down together as a family and eat corn beef and cabbage. Those are two staples of our family now that my wife has brought in from her traditions. And when asked what mine was, it was chicken pot pie. We ate chicken pot pie all the time. We had It was a super simple recipe where we talked about eat. You grill the chicken, you chop the chicken up, we put it in the cream and mushroom soup, add some water, put in some vegetables, either frozen or fresh, doesn't really matter. Uh, you put in chunks of potatoes, and then you put those, you know, those pop can biscuits, you put those on top, and then you put it in the oven for, for I believe, 375. I have the recipe in the actual newsletter. And then you cook it, and it's simple and ready to go. And so when we're talking about systems and processes, that was an old faithful that my mom taught to me. I, I learned how to make it. I made it in college for my roommates and for my wife. I, we do it now for our children. And so it, it's become this recipe and it's become this staple that we always have chicken on hand. We always have potatoes and frozen vegetables or fresh vegetables. And then we have cream of mushroom soup thrown in the back so that at any point in time, we can quickly and easily make this. And we know it's going to be exactly the same. And so when you start to think about your business, there's two areas of this that I want you to, to gather. One from, from this podcast. The first one is that it's important that your business can run and flow and function so that your employees can have the freedom to sit down with their families and have their own conversations, even if it's sitting in silence, even if you have teenagers that don't want to really be at the dinner table and they just want to sit there and not talk to you. That's still better than them going off and eating in their room. That's what all the data shows. Give them that opportunity in order to make it home for dinner every single night. And so I've had people on LinkedIn and ask these things and say, well, well, why can't you have that and still go to the office? And I'm telling you that you could, but the amount of family time that is cut into a commute or pulling a parent out of the house is more detrimental to the family than is impactful to the business. So let me let me rephrase that. You are doing your employees a larger disservice to them and their family than you are doing a service for your business by taking them physically out of the home and placing them into an office. Because the data shows that arguably remote workers are more productive while at home. The data is all there that showcases that remote workers are more pro productive than office workers. The data also shows that it is this significant negative. Am I saying? Let me let me make sure I'm phrasing this correctly. It is a is is it of it is of significant negative impact when you remove a family member from the household and dinner table. It creates mental, physical and ment mental issues within children and the household. So you are taking a member of your workforce out of their primary reason for existence within the family and placing them into a temporary means, your business. And the weight of impact is more significant 
of you taking them out of the them out of their home than it is putting them into their business. You might argue they're a little bit more productive. Sure, although they're a little bit more productive in the office. Maybe they are for your people. Maybe. I don't know what your business is. I would argue against it in any scenario, but let's just say for whatever reason they're a warehouse worker or something like that. Fine. Make it so that they have the flexibility to do portions of their job from home so they can make it home on time for dinner because that is significantly more impactful having them at the dinner table than it is having them in the office. That's the first takeaway. The second takeaway here is that chicken pot pie that got put on the dinner table. Those of you who are saying, well, I don't have time to make dinner every night. Okay. But what if you systematized it through having recipes on hand, having the supplies needed in a closet somewhere that you're able to quickly and systematically spin up to ensure that dinner is there. You don't have to think about what's for dinner. You just make the recipes using the ingredients that you have, similar to how you should do it within your business. When you provide a task and you don't have a checklist or a how to do that task, you make it so people have to use their brain power to think about how to do the task more so than how to improve the task or deliver the task. So if I were to tell somebody, go set the table, let's say you're, in, you're working in the hospitality industry and you would say, go set the table. They have to more so use more brain power on what it means to set the table than actually providing the service. So if you were to just take it and you say, the fork goes here, the knife goes there, do this every single time, boop, 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 boop. I do that like clockwork. And now I'm able to more effectively uh, channel my energy towards the hospitality, towards servicing other members in the restaurant than I am of having to figure out how to set the table exactly the same way every single time. And that's how you should take your systems and processes. You should build a system and process of the things that you do the most, have the supplies and the materials on hand so that you can systematically do it over and over and over and over again, and so that your people can use their brain power on creativity, hospitality, customer service, bigger things, improvements, getting the 1% better, all of those things, and take them out of the minute details. That is the power of systems and processes. And that is the freedom that they grant you. So while there is freedom in systems and processes, while there is freedom when you build those systems and processes to empower your workforce to, to come home, the real key here is there's freedom in chicken pot pie. Take that one with you. So guys, hopefully you got a lot out of this. Hopefully you enjoyed this podcast. We don't run ads here. We're never going to run ads. If All we ask is that if you want more information about systems and processes, that you reach out to us. You can go to goworkwherever.com. Take your business assessment or your personality assessment soon where it'll diagnose who you are, where you land on the innovation scale. And then you can also take a business score evaluation to learn more about your business, how you can implement systems and processes, how you can be more efficient, how you can become more automated, how you can run a business that works wherever. That's all I ask. That's the only ask there is, is that when you feel like you're getting information out of this, this podcast and you're like, I want to do that, because the answer is you can do that. All of the things we talk about on this podcast, you can do it and we can teach you how. And all you have to do is ask and we're here for you. So guys, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for listening. And until next time, see you. Hey there, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications for all the latest videos from Capital Presence.